Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined today by Mr. Bill Chase. You did something really cool. I did a video on a Reef Grabber automatic pistol a couple of years ago that was selling at auction, and it turns out you're the one who bought it, and you went through and actually restored it to a pretty darn awesome looking condition from having been a complete wreck. <laughs> <laughs> I was told it was in a fire. Oof. That's never a good thing. No. So, so, I mean, I don't know if you've watched the TV programs, but I have, and I know a bunch of the audience has. Most people only are aware of firearms restoration as the subject of bad reality TV. But it turns out firearms restoration is a very real thing. Um, possible. There are some companies out there. Uh, the one that comes to my mind is Turnbull. It yeah. does really gorgeous work on Colts and Winchesters. Right. Um, but you did more than just, I mean, this isn't just refinishing. You were manufacturing complete new parts for this reef grabber. Right. How does that work? <laughs> well, luckily I had another reef grabber to copy, which makes it a whole lot easier. Okay. But I have done it without things to copy. Uh, it just takes a lot longer. You have a background in machining? Yes, I was, uh chief engineer of a plastic injection molder for just 30 years. Okay. That's a pretty good background for yeah, making things. Yeah. And then was responsible for all the tooling, so dealt with all the machine tools. Okay. So there's really, there are a couple steps to this. You have to deal with creating any parts that simply don't exist anymore. Right. You have to deal with restoring a surface. So if a surface is pitted or damaged, you have to fix that before you can just re-blue it, or right, else right. you end up with the very stereotypical, really bad re-blue where you can see all the pits that have right. been blued over, and mm -hmm. you don't want that for a proper professional-looking gun. Right. So, uh, for example, what do you do to, to restore the surface? Well, again, it, it depends on the depth of the pits, which is, you know, the, the biggest uh, problem. So if they're really big, really deep, you weld them up and then take them back to flat. And then once you've got all those really deep pits taken out of there, you go back to the surface, basically with a polishing stone or a series of polishing stones, and you polish it back to a flat surface, flat uniform surface. Okay. Which of course destroys all the engraving. <laughs> usually it'll take it off. It's usually that deep. The engraving isn't very deep. And then, uh, you know, you've got to get that put back on. Okay. So an engraver can do it. A guy with a pantograph can do some of it. It all depends how it was put on. Okay. And I think you mentioned on this one, you left the markings on this side. Um, you, you left some remnant of them, kind of balanced how much you took the surface down. Right. So right. it's not quite perfect, but it left you the engraving so that there was something there for the engraver to copy. Right. And he could just recut everything then but just to a uniform depth okay instead of having to like give him the design and have him create it entirely right. from scratch right so a lot of this is about compromise in how much do you want to spend how much time do you want to have invested versus what outcome are you looking for right okay um you mentioned to me off camera how long you've been working on the formula for the the bluing that you did on that you're right a long time the the Carbona Blue, you know, was done by everybody. It was probably, well, it was done in Europe. It was done by Colt. It was done by Smith. It was done by Savage. But nowhere is it really documented how it was done. When, so When you say Carbona Blue, what is that? Carbona was a, uh, a chemical that was sold by the American Furnace Company. And that's about as much as I found out about it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and it, it was mixed with other chemicals and then generated in a furnace where it generated smoke, and the smoke is what generates the color. Hmm. So depending on what you use to generate the smoke, you will get variations in the color. Okay. And Turnbull wouldn't tell me specifically how to do it. So <laughs> it was a lot of years of experimentation. Years, okay. Years, yeah. This one looks like it turned out pretty gorgeous. Yeah, it's nice and uniform, nice dark blue-black. Okay, and this is something that serious 
firearms appraisers and collectors can recognize the different tones in finish, not just different colors. You know, there's bluing and then there's black finishes and parkerizing. But within bluing, the subtleties of exactly what color tone really make a big difference. And that's one of the ways people look for uh, guns that have been restored. Right. Or uh, are more so are original. Right. Yeah. So another big element of this thing was when you got this gun, it had no grips on it at all. Right. And this is an original one, and this is the one that you have recreated. Those grips look like identical. How they does were, that happen? They were cast from originals. Okay. So you make a mold out of silicone rubber, and then basically pour a, uh, this is a polyester, two-part polyester that's poured into the mold, and it'll bring up It'll bring up scratches. It'll bring up hmm. hairline cracks. It really picks up a detail. And again, it, it's a long, drawn-out process in order to... You, you've got to make a housing that you're going to put the silicone rubber into that you put over the grips, and you know, then, then you take it apart, and now you've got a nice, perfect casting of that grip, and now you've got to fill that cavity with the, with the grip material without putting any bubbles in it, which, <laughs> you know, you can easily do that within three or four tries. I was going to ask how many, in order to get two good grip panels, how many did you oh, have to I throw away? Half a dozen. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's not too bad. That, that's fewer than I was expecting. Yeah. Sometimes it works well, and sometimes it just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As much art as anything else? That's about it, yeah. Okay. But again, we're learning. It's so, getting easier. I think there are people out there who says, who think that this is like a regular business that a lot of people engage in. You know, I'll, I'll get the gun and I'll restore it and then I'll sell it for a profit. How much time do you think you have invested in that thing? Over a hundred hours, I would imagine. Okay, so if we take that and we apply any sort of reasonable machinist hourly rate or mechanics hourly rate or artisans hourly rate, you're talking a crap load of money. Right. This isn't something you can just do on a whim. And, oh, I'll just whip up a, a restored reef cropper. This really is as much a labor of love as it is anything else. Right, yeah. When I when I bought it, because I had one to copy, I thought this will be a piece of cake. And then between the, the refinishing, you know, the surface was all rusted mm -hmm. and no grips and pieces missing. It, it just, it's not something I'll do again, I don't think. <laughs> Oh. Unless I really want it for myself, you know, then then you can put in as many hours as you're willing to. But I already had one. It's nowhere near as nice looking as this, but I had one, so I knew I could do it. But I I thought I could maybe make a dollar, and I won't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if you aren't going to make a dollar without a middleman, the idea of someone else hiring someone like you to do this sort of work and then sell the final product at a premium, it's got to be something extremely special. Right. Especially considering, in general, how much more valuable guns are in their original condition instead of being restored. Well, there is a point where restoring doesn't hurt. And well, and this, this is was, definitely an example. Right. That was yeah. in that, that condition. But it's kind of that point where if restoring doesn't hurt the value, it's going to cost so much in time and effort to do the restoration that you're probably not going to make any money on it anyway. Right. Somebody's got to want it real bad. Yeah. So th these are more, th this isn't market uh, profit driven. This is really, I have a personal connection to this gun and I'd like to have someone restore it. That sort of yeah. motive. Yeah, right. Okay. So when you did brand new parts like the trigger, because mm -hmm. there was no trigger in that gun when you bought it. Right. But how do you do that? Or is this a trial and error? Or do you no. sketch well, it out on a napkin? <laughs> no, I, every part I make, I draw up on CAD. Okay. Uh, and again, I had a trigger, but the way the original trigger was made, it, I couldn't make it that way. So this is just machined from the solid, and it duplicates the operation and duplicates the basic shape, but it's not exactly the same as the original. Now, my understanding is CNC machines are this cool magic box, and you can just put a piece of metal in and hit the button, and it'll spit out whatever your part is. So you obviously have never run a CNC machine. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. I, I have. In fact, I have done. Uh, I have a certification, a very basic CNC mill and oh, lathe okay. certification. 
Uh, but there are a lot of people out there who right. have not run a CNC and don't realize that you can't just push a button and have it spit out a part. Right. Um, You've I, got to feed it all the exact information. And you have and, to and jigs and fixtures. You have to yeah. hold it in the right place, right. get the right cutting paths. Right. Uh, do you use CNC machinery or do you use manual machinery? I typically use manual, but uh, there's a lot of cases where I'm using wire EDM. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, like uh, I recently just had to make a spring, a small leaf spring that was contoured, you know. <laughs> And again, I had a broken one, so you, you again, you got to kind of piece it back together and then drop the shape as it should be, and then a wire EDM can follow the, whatever contour you give it, so it'll do two dimensions. Right. So do you, for something like that, you take a piece of flat sheet steel, cut the profile, and then heat and bend it to the right? No, range. no, I, I cut it to the shape, Oh, wow. to the contour. Wow, okay. And then you're cutting it through a piece of steel that's the width you want. So you're, you're taking a block of steel and right. cutting a leaf spring. Right. Wow. Man, okay. And it works well to duplicate springs, especially, you know, to a form of leaf spring, that they typically file, uh, file out. Okay. They're covered with file marks. Hmm. So it wasn't an easy process way back when. So I think we pretty well covered the reef grabber. This obviously is not your first attempt at something like this. No. Um, what's the what's the most complicated, involved restoration you've done? It, it involves a little bit of a story in that uh, it, it was Sounds a, good. It was a serial, uh, serial design who did the Savage guns. Okay. S-E-A-R-L-E. -E. Right. Yeah. And uh, when the Savage Corporation closed... There was a safe at the auction. It wasn't open. It couldn't be opened at the time. <laughs> okay. A friend of mine bought it, got it open, and found inside of it the 1903 Savage prototype. But it was just missing a couple parts. It had a slide, a barrel, and a receiver. All the small parts, grips, magazines, were missing. But the patent drawings were fairly uh, complete, fairly detailed. Hmm. So what I did was uh, draw up the three components and look at how they go together. And then I could go back to the patent drawing, see what part did this. This is a hammer. I knew where it went. And between knowing where it had a fit and what it looked like, I could draw that part up. Wow. And I had to do that with each of the missing parts, and there were a bunch of them. Uh, no kidding. Yeah. Jeez. So that project took me six months to complete. Not full time, obviously, but wow. it still was over a six month duration. How typical is it for patent drawings to be good enough to do that? My understanding is that usually the patent drawings kind of only have a, a vague similarity to the finished product. That's true. Okay. And they, they obviously don't have any dimensions. Yeah. But. <laughs> In this case, there was enough there, and I think this was more detailed than a lot that okay. you see today. It probably also helped that you were working on the first prototype, not an eventual production version, which well, that almost certainly made would have had many easy. differences. <laughs> well, true, if it had a, a real one to copy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so this, uh, it was a project in itself. You know, I'm wow. making a magazine, that's a project in itself. I've done that several times. Okay. Like That's got to be challenging. I mean, magazines are very finicky. You have to have the things like feed lips just right, or else they just don't work. Right. Yeah. They can they can be adjusted a little as you go, but not a lot. The key is know. making magazines for collectible guns that aren't ever going to be shot, so <laughs> no one will ever know. <laughs> that, that's Yeah, that helps. <laughs> All right. Well, very cool. Thank you very much for uh, joining us and sharing some of those stories. That's Thanks for having Fascinating. Me. Was fun. Thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully, you enjoyed the video. Tune back in tomorrow for more Forgotten Weapons.